I now call the June 23rd, 2020 meeting of City of High Point Planning and Zoning Commission to order. My name is Tom Kirkman. I am the chair of the commission. I will now ask the recording secretary to conduct a roll call of the commissioners that are in attendance tonight. Commissioners, when I call your name, please answer present if you are physically in this room and remote if you are connected remotely. Do that. Present. Kirkman. Present. Ms. McGill. Ms. McGill. She's on mute. Unmute. I'm sorry, present. Uh, remote, correct? You're connecting remotely? Yes, present remotely. Ms. Stone. Remote. Ms. Swift. Remote. Mr. Venable. Remote. Mr. Walsh. Present. Mr. Wheatley. Present. Mr. Chairman, we have eight members here. We have a quorum. I also want to acknowledge that the staff from the Planning and Development Department, Transportation Department, City Attorney's Office are also participating in the meeting and will provide us with technical and professional assistance this evening. We will now consider the minutes of the February 25th, 2020 meeting of the commission. Uh, do any of the commissioners uh, have any questions or noted any corrections to the minutes as they've been presented to us? If not, I'll ask for a motion to approve. I move to approve the minutes for the February 25th meeting of Planning and Zoning Commission. All right, Mr. Jubeck has made a motion to approve. I'll second. Mr. Walsh has made a motion to second. Commissioners, when I call your name, please say either yes or no for approval of the February 25th minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, Mr. Jubeck. Yes. Mr. Kirkman. Yes. Ms. McGill. Yes. Ms. Stone. Yes. Ms. Swift. Yes. Mr. Venable. Yes. Mr. Walsh. Yes. Mr. Wheatley. Yes. We have nine vote or eight votes in approval of the minutes. Very well. By vote of eight zero, the minutes of February 25, 2020 have been approved as presented. Before we begin the public hearing this evening, on behalf of the Commission, I would like to welcome everyone. The Commission is charged with reviewing and making recommendations to the City Council on a variety of development applications and on plans and policies for the City. Our review includes conducting a public hearing to obtain additional information and comment that could be important in evaluating the options. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting state restrictions on public gatherings, the Commission is meeting remotely in accordance with state law this evening. This necessitates some changes to our normal meeting procedure, which I will take a moment to explain. Four commissioners are present at City Hall this evening, and four other commissioners are joining us remotely. Items on the agenda will be heard as normal, with a member of city staff presenting a summary of the application, followed by the staff's recommendation the applicant and those assisting the applicant. All, all who are attending this meeting remotely will then be given an opportunity to present information in support of the item. Planning and development staff published and sent notices that solicited the public to provide comments on these items by email, phone, and letter. Proceeding public comments have been made available to each of the commissioners for review prior to this meeting. The period for public comments on these items will extend for an additional 24 hours beyond the conclusion of this evening's meeting. For that reason, the commission will not be voting on any hearing item on tonight's agenda. Instead, this meeting will be recessed to Thursday, June 25th at 6 o'clock p.m. This will allow the Commission to further discuss any additional information or comments that are submitted during that time before making an official recommendation to the City Council. With that, we'll begin tonight's agenda items. First request, Card Davis 2 LLC, Zoning Map Amendment 20-05. Mr. Chan. <coughs> This is Herb Shannon, Senior Planner for the City of High Point Planning and Development Department, and I'll be providing a staff summary of Zoning Map Amendment 20-05. This is a request to resume a three and a half acre track of land near the southwest corner of NC-68, also known as East Chester Drive and Willow Dairy Road. 
The site's approximately 7, 570 feet west of NC-68 and located approximately 400, excuse me, 540 feet south of Willow Dairy Road. I'm just trying to bring my laser pointer here. Well, the app, you can see um, an exhibit showing the location of the site. That's that area highlighted in green. The applicant's request to rezone this site from its current conditional use light industrial <coughs> district to a conditional zoning light industrial district to allow a warehousing use site. This zoning site is part of a larger nine acre industrial park. And once again, I'm going to try and bring my laser pointer up to show you this site. You pick a color after you select it. Let's try that. Could be it. It's kind of small. We'll go. We'll proceed for it. Um, this site is part of a larger nine-acre industrial park. As you can see, this area. I don't know if you can see that little highlight. That nine-acre tract was annexed to the city and granted its current condition use light industrial zoning in 2000. The frontage of this site was in the, is in the East Chester Gateway Corridor Overlay District. This frontage has developed with a 30,000 square foot multi tenant building and a stormwater patrol pond. Land use policies established by the East Chester Drive Court Claim and Land Use Plan does not support warehousing use. Thus, that original zoning approval did not permit any type of warehousing use on the site, and that is the type of use the applicant desires for the rear of the property. So he has submitted a request to uh, rezone this rear portion of the site to a conditional zoning like industrial district. And allow the warehousing as a permitted use. This rear portion of this development is outside the East Chester Gateway Corridor Overlay District. No changes are proposed to the front portion of this site that will remain conditional use like industrial. That's that where you have the existing multi tenant building and the stormwater control pond. This only, only pertains to the rear of this industrial development and the zoning site. The only change is a lot of warehousing use and the terminology far as what is a prohibited use has been updated to match the current standards of the development ordinance. Quick update far as key points from the staff analysis. The zoning site is outside of the East Chester Gateway Quarter Overlay District and as condition allowable uses will be similar to those permitted on adjacent industrial parcels. The applicant has offered to carry forward all relevant conditions from that 2000 zoning approval, include, including um, that the site meet other requirements of East Chester Quarter District as far as development standards and some architectural standards that is governing the existing or other portion of this industrial development. As to mitigating adverse impact on adjacent properties, <coughs> the site does have a restricted industrial land use designation. This is an exhibit showing the land use plan um, for this area, the areas that's highlighted in purple is designated by land use plan for restricted industrial. So the, that land use designation does govern this site and surrounding area. And the conditions off by the applicant will allow similar uses as allowed on adjacent properties to the west. The planning and development department is recommending approval of this request to rezone this three and a half acre site to a conditional zoning light industrial district. The request is consistent with adopted policy guidance. Because as conditioned, the requested CZLI district is supported by policy of the land use plan, does not conflict with previously established land use policies governing this segment. It's just important. Furthermore, the request is reasonable in the public interest because as conditioned, the requested condition of the light industrial will be consistent with adjacent zoning approvals granted for similar abutting LI zone properties lying outside the gateway from the overlay. As always, the commission must place an official record a statement of consistency, and you do have that statement as part of your staff report for your consideration. That is a brief summary of this request. Are there any questions of staff at this time? If not, I will ask if the applicant is present. 
I am remotely. This is Mike Carr. I'm the uh, uh, managing partner for Carr Davis II. Great. Oh, thank you. Uh, do any of the commissioners have questions for Mr. Carr this evening? Apparently not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carr. Uh, we'll get back to you if anything comes up during our deliberation. Uh, does anybody like to discuss All this? Right. Yes. Commissioners can discuss yeah. nothing. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Uh, what we'll do then, we will close the public hearing portion on this item and we will table it and reset until Thursday evening. Uh, between now and then, commissioners are asked to review any further public comments received on the item, which we will give further consideration to, and then and make a recommendation at the recess meeting on Thursday beginning at 6 p.m. Right, second item on tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second item on tonight's agenda <coughs> Mirage Property Zoning Map Amendment 20-06. Mr. Shannon. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Kurt Shannon, Senior Plan for the Planning and Development Department. This next agenda item, Zoning Map Amendment 20-06, is a request to establish an initial city high point zoning for a 4.9 acre parcel in the northeastern portion of the city's planning area off the Boulder Road. The site in question is highlighted in green on the map exhibit that's being presented. It's lo located along the south side of Boulder Road, approximately 430 feet east of Tarrant Road. The application has submitted an annexation application and is zoning map amendment application to establish initial city zoning on this property. There's an existing commercial use or industrial use on this site. The building contractor's office with outdoor storage. It's currently operating. No new development is anticipated. The property is designated by adopted land use plan for restricted industrial uses. This slide shows the land use plan for this portion of the city. The area highlighted in light purple is that the restricted industrial, that darker purple is pet industrial. As you can see, See, we have existing commercial um, conditional use light industrial directly to the north of the site. The property <coughs> under Gif is currently under Gifford County's jurisdiction has a light industrial zoning. They're requesting city high point light industrial zoning, and the uses, the use of the site would be allowed under the light industrial district by the city's development ordinance. The requested LI district is consistent with adopted policy guidance because the land the site is designated restricted industrial by the land use plan. And the LI district does not conflict with any adopted policy guidance for this very area. Furthermore, the request is reasonable in the public interest because the LI district will permit the current industrial use on the property and is compatible with previous zoning approvals granted in this long road. Therefore, staff is recommending the approval of this request to establish a light industrial zoning on this site. And included in your packet is a staff consistency statement for the commission's consideration. Um, Are there any questions at this time? Thank you, Mr. Shannon. Very well, thank you, Mr. Shannon. Is the applicant with us this evening? Hearing no response, I will assume no. Question. I had a question for the applicant. We'll, we'll, we can address that to Mr. Shannon then. Okay. If they can dig something up. That's right. Yeah. So, in the uh, thing here, it's, stop for a second. That was Mr. Juzak. Just asking the question. Thank you. Um, it says the applicants requesting annexation and establishment of uh, the city zoning to have access to city utilities. Yes. Okay. There is something on that site already, a building that I assume has utilities in it from, but they're not from the city. And then it says no new development is anticipated. And so. To me, the question is, why do you want to access the city utilities if you're not going to do any more development? Well, currently they're on a well and septic system. They've been having problems with the water, and they also, in the future, know they're going to have to replace the septic system. So instead of going through that expense from what they explained to staff, uh, at this point in time, they would desire to have the city utilities. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioner have anything? Uh, 
they'd like to ask city staff this evening on this request? If not, I'll close the public hearing on this item. Commission members are asked to please review any additional public comments received on this item over the next 24 hours, and we will give further consideration and make a recommendation at the recess meeting on Thursday beginning at 6 p.m. The next item on tonight's agenda, Keystone Group Incorporated, Zoning Map Amendment 20-07. Mr. Shannon again. This is Chair Kerr Shannon, the Planning Development Department. This is the presentation for Zoning Map Amendment Case 20-07. This is a request to amend the conditions of a previously approved plan development. This is for the North Coral Subdivision. This site was granted its current plan development residential or PDR district 2016. I wouldn't know that was part of the adoption of the current development ordinance. This site is located in the western portion of the city's planning area. Um, the exhibit that's currently being um, presented shows the general location of the site in reference to the city. This is a blow up of that area. As you look at this map, everything that is noted in white are lands that have already been annexed or within the city at high point uh, corporate limits. Areas in gray or unincorporated Gilbert County. All of this area is within the city of High Point's planning area and eligible for annexation. As I previously noted, this site was annexed and granted its current PDR district zoning in 2016. The site is approximately 114 acres. It's located along the south side of Bolson Road, approximately 1,300 feet west of Atkins Road. The previously adopted PDR district included a master plan and zoning conditions allowing up to 300 dwelling units consisting of a mixture of single family homes, twin homes, and townhome dwellings. The applicant has requested to amend this previous zoning approval and is requesting to increase the developments allowable number of units from 300 to 402 units. Also, terminology within the ordinance is being, or within that conditional zoning ordinance, is being updated to match the language of the current development ordinance. So, as you look at the conditional use permit, you see certain areas that are stricken out of the language. That is not a substantial change. That is updating the language to match the language in the current ordinance. The adopted land use plan classifies this area as low density residential. That's the area you see highlighted in yellow on the current exhibit. Those areas are designated by the adopted land use plan as low density residential, which permits residential densities up to five units per acre. The requested amendment, the increase for an additional 102 dwelling units, would increase the density from the current 2.6 units to 3.5 units per acre. All other conditions from the previously approved conditional zoning warrants are being carried forward in the applicant's request. This is the plan development master plan that was submitted with this application. There was a similar master plan that was submitted in the 2016 submittal. There's been no change. It is exactly the same. This highlights the various tracks of the development. One moment, please. Yes. Okay. Once again, this is um, the master plan that for this development, there's been no change in the layout, no changes in the configuration of the tracks. Um, staff has put together a brief little tool to summarize for you each of the tracks. Track A is about 12 acres. That's intended for single family dwellings or a clubhouse. There's no change proposed. Track B is intended for single family dwellings. It was initially approved for 120 units. This track is currently under development. Um, they, the applicant has reduced the length to 96. This change was to match the, the subdivision plat that was recorded for the specific track. Track C and D and tracks E1 and E2, they're all intended for single family dwellings, townhome dwellings, or twin homes. There are no changes. And finally, track F, that was included for, for a clubhouse or amenity area or for residential dwellings. It was initially approved for 30 units. They were reducing that to 28. 
That is that track is currently under development and they've offered that reduction that is matching the subdivision plan that was recorded for that area. And once again, that is a the location of tracks. I would note, as with their previous approval, this approval, approximately 90 acres of the site or the individual tracks, the 24 acres of the system road right away in a variety of areas that will be in common here. As with the prior thing, if you add up all the units, all the tracks, it exceeds 402 units. But what this does, it gives the applicant flexibility in the manner in which the various tracks can develop. But the end result is they cannot exceed, if approved, the 402 units. They they position the tracks with those numbers, give them flexibility as they get into it. If they run into any speaker scope, that just gives them flexibility for developing the individual tracks. I would note for the purpose of, of informational purposes, the staff reports includes the transportation impact table and school district impact table that all the transportation conditions from the 2016 zoning approvals are being carried forward. I would note the TIA that they did was based upon there being 450 units. So all the improvements that they have noted in transportation conditions was based upon a higher number of dwelling units. Key things to point from your staff report as far as compatibility with the surrounding area, this request does not change previously approved validability findings from initial approval. There's no change in the type of residential uses allowed. There are no changes in the developed standards for residential uses. As for mitigating impacts, except for the change in density, all the previously adopted conditions are being carried forward. There's no change in the configuration of the tracks. You still have a configuration where single family or the lower intensity uses along the eastern parts of the track of the site to the smaller lots in this abutting single family subdivision. The main portion of the site will still be for single family or townhomes, and those abutting uh, surrounding lots or larger lots of five acres or greater. In environmental impacts, there are no changes. Uh, you see that stream that uh, runs through the middle of the site. The master plan shows the same stream, bu stream buffers, and they have designated about 350 to 500 foot wide area that corresponds to the floodplain area as environmental area. And finally, all the previously approved transportation improvements, connection to the east of Sweet Metal Road, connection to Quail Middle Lane, Installation of turn lanes along Wilson Roads, all those are still required, and some of those improvements have been completed. Thus, the Planning and Development Department is recommending approval of this request to amend this 414-acre PDR district. The request is consistent um, with adopted policy guidance because both the land use plan and the Northwest Area Plan and designates this area as low density residential which is a land use classification that supports residential densities up to five units per acre. And the request is reasonable in the public interest because the impacts are mitigated from the requested increase in dwelling units, which would be a maximum of 102 additional units, increasing the plan development max density to 3.5 units per acre. And you do have, have a consistency statement in your staff report for your consideration. I know there's a lot of information on this request or any questions of staff at this time. The chair recognizes Mr. Jews that. Uh, Mr. Shannon, um, I'm, I'm looking on page 42 of your report yes. where they have the estimated trip generation. And I uh, will admit that I'm totally confused by uh, traffic analysis, impact analyses, where you have many fewer trips than one would normally expect to be uh, generated by uh, the number of houses and all. But just using the data that's here, it says that in the original um, analysis, 300 dwelling units were going to generate 2,792 trips yes. per day. Well, and, and then they have the 450 number, but that's not relevant anymore because they're now requesting the 402. Yes. So the 402 dwelling units are going to generate 3,174 trips, okay? Yes. All right, so 
the number of units is is going up 34 percent, 300 to 402. But the, the number of trips is only going up 13.7 percent. However, they calculate them in the first place. It would seem to me that there would be some sort of parity when those things are are changing. They're they're adding in all these houses, and and it, it's like they're not going to have any any traffic associated with those houses. I will see. Is anyone from the transportation department available to address that question for the commission members? Sure. Hi, this is Greg Venable from the transportation department. Uh, you are correct. There are um, more trips. Uh, you can't. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison. So when you're looking at uh, dwelling units, depending on the type of dwelling units, so if you have multifamily, single-family, there's a, a, a difference in the amount of trips generated uh, by the type of residential development that you have. Uh, the TIA was done for 450 trips, which all the improvements associated with that TIA, which would account for 450 trips, um, are being implemented um, by the applicant. So there, even though they are increasing their trips, the improvements necessary for 450 dwelling units um, have been agreed to. All right, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced, but I'll accept what you're saying, um, which leads me to a, a, a second question. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, practically speaking, those 400 units are all going to go out one street, the uh, North Borough. Now, yes, I know you can cut over on Sweet Meadow and you can cut over on Quail Meadow, but those are going into quiet little subdivisions with narrow roads and no curbs. Uh, I mean, it seems to me most people are going to be going out North Borough, and it's hard to imagine how 400 units are going to go out that one exit onto Boylston Road. Or is that a question for the applicant? <laughs> yes, the applicant or Greg wants to expand any on the analysis. They look at, uh, this is Greg Venable again, they look at percentages about, uh, you know, your access points and, and they determine when they did the TIA, uh, the amount of, of trips that would go out each of those access points. So that was approved. Uh, in the original TIA, uh, you're correct. There, you know, there'll be a lot of traffic going out North Borough, but you do have other access points where that will take off some of the traffic uh, going out to that uh, that intersection. Is there any notion that there would be other access points to the west when surrounding properties are developed? I mean, it looks like there's a stub there for whatever that road name is going to be between track E1 and E2. But there's no nothing currently planned over there, apparently. Uh, this is Lee Burnett, the plan director. Um, that stuff to the west, uh, when, a, when a road is stubbed, it, it doesn't, it's not just stubbed for the street connection, but also for water and sewer connection. So with it, the utility lines will be stubbed to that, to that track to the west. So as it develops, and connects in, it will have the capability to go further west and connect on towards uh, the other railway. So uh, it does open up the area to the west for that to be developed uh, with the possibility of additional connections up to north or to the south as well. Okay, Mr. Venable, Mark Walsh. Yes, sir. Uh, the question I think on our TIA, that was also broke down for single family and townhome trips, correct? That's correct. That's what I was trying to say earlier is that depending on the, the amount of trips, um, usually single family uh, is going to have, have a higher trip generation than right. family. So when you have more than that, you're going to reduce your. I your, think that's uh, where he got his 34 or 13 percent because they're going to do townhomes separate than they are single family. Correct. Correct? Yes. Is it? This is Thad Juzak again. Is it is it logical that a that a townhome generates fewer trips than a house, a, a detached dwelling? So when they when they we look at this, uh, we use a trip generation uh, software, and this is based on studies that that have been done uh, all across the country. And yes, um, multifamily uh, in general does uh, produce less trips than than single family development. Thank you. Uh, before we look, before we leave this, this is Commissioner uh, Kirkman. Uh, I think what Commissioner Duzak touched on a moment ago. We do have two access points. However, 
And Mr. Juzak pointed out, just because you have two access points doesn't mean they'll both be used. Uh, and so I suppose there's some concern, if you can look at the map, for someone to leave the main part of the development, their quickest way out to Boston Road is obviously Northboro Street, to turn right on Sweet Meadow, and then to turn uh, left on Quail Meadow would seem almost unlikely. Uh, I mean, is this, is this also factored in, or is it just a matter of we've got two access points, so we're good? I know sometimes access points, the reason you have a second one is because the first one becomes blocked, you want emergency vehicles uh, to be able to access the development. So I understand that. But I kind of share Mr. Uh, Juzak's concern about the, the number of cars. I, I doubt it will be a 50-50 split between Northboro and Sweet Meadow, is my point. Is, is any of that factored in? Uh, this is Greg Gumbel again. Yeah, I mean, we we look at that, and the engineer uh, who does the traffic impact analysis for the uh, the applicant uh, figures that in the percentages. Um, as far as the that road being able to handle that amount of traffic, it is um, it is designed to handle uh, that much traffic that would go out there. Um, but again, as far as access points, that's more of a, a planning condition. So we base our access points off of the number of units involved in the development. So. Um, I think that's kind of where you have the the additional access points involved as well. Very good, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Herb Shan, I would just note for the record record the connection to Quail Middle Lane to the south that has gone in that is in place now. The connection to Sweet Middle Road that is in place now also. And from my last visit to the site, the access from Bolson Road, the applicants in the process of doing road improvement improvements for the turn lanes into the development. Very good, thank you. Do the commissioners have any more questions for city staff? Thank you, Mr. Shen. Is the applicant present? This is Judy Stalder. Can you hear me all right? Yes, Ms. Stalder. Hello? Yes. Um, I was unable to connect with my laptop, so I'm on my phone. Okay. Um, but thank you for listening. Um, my name is Judy Stalder, 3735 Admiral Drive. Um, this request is to increase the overall density by a little less than one unit per acre. Um, North Borough is in the beginnings of construction, and now that we're into the development and we can see market trends changing, um, and we can see how we respond. The traffic impact analysis was based on the possibility of 450 units. We've already done the widening of Boylston Road and um, um, constructed a left turn lane. Um, it's over $400,000 worth of improvements, and we trust traffic engineers to tell us what we should do in order to build these subdivisions and afterwards to sell these ho homes to people who will live in them and be able to get in and out of the subdivision. Our reputation rests on that. So we are confident that the transportation network is going to support um, the homes we build. Um, there are adequate points of access. Some of them are closed to prevent construction traffic from going into the smaller neighborhoods. Um, but if a, if a property owner feels like they need to go that way to get out, they will. If they feel like the connection on Northboro is um, better, then they will go that way. Um, and there are other points of access that will become available as this property and adjacent properties develop. Um, the tracks that are already under development will actually have reduced density. Um, property owners that have purchased in these tracks will not see increased density in their immediate neighborhood as a result of this request. For instance, track B goes from 120 units to a maximum of 96, that's single family homes. And tract F goes down from 30 units to a maximum of 28 homes. Um, the other tracks will not see any increase in the number of homes permitted on each track um, because the actual number of homes permitted adds up to 516 overall. 
But instead of building 300 of the 516, we're proposing now that we build 402 of the 516. We contacted the neighbors by mail, and we received calls from the owner of the large tract to the west, southwest, um, wanting to know when the um, connection across the creek would be made. And then we received a phone call from an owner on the south that also wanted connection. So this is an area that is ripe for development. Um, the land use plan says it's appropriate for up to five units an acre. Um, so it certainly supports this. And we feel like the traffic engineering that was done on this actually supports it as well. So we ask for your favorable recommendations. Very good. Uh, any of the commissioners have further questions from Ms. Stallman? If not, uh, um, I'll close the public hearing portion on this item and ask the commission members to discuss the wish. Anything? In that case we will table this until Thursday evening when we'll get further consideration to any additional public comments we may receive and then we'll make a recommendation at the recess meeting on Thursday beginning at 6 p.m. Next item on tonight's agenda Braxton Real Estate and Development LLC Zoning Map Amendment 20-08 Shannon with the Planning and Development Department. This presentation is for Zoning Map Amendment 2008. This is a request to rezone a 29 acre site from its current conditional use residential single family five district to a conditional zoning residential multifamily five. The site's located in the western portion of the city's planning area. It's located along the east side of Pony Town Road, approximately 500 feet north of Panther Ridge Road. This 29 acre site was annexed into the city and, and obtained its current zoning in 2007 to support a single family subdivision. However, the site, the, the site's steep topography made such a development difficult without significant grading. This is just a blow up of that site. This is a topographic map of the site. The front half of the site fronting along Pointy Town Road has a moderately sloping terrain. However, as you see from the topographic map, the rear portion of the site has some steep terrain. With a topography map, the closer lines, the steeper terrain. And it's that rear portion of the site that, if developed with single family, would require a significant amount of grading. The applicant has applied to rezone the site to a conditional zoning RM5 district to reduce the amount of grading required and to allow some flexibility in site design. The adopted land use plan classifies this area as low density residential. This is a slide of the city's land use plan, adopted land use plan for this area. And you see that area highlighted in yellow is the area dated, designated as low density residential, which supports residential densities of the five units per acre. The applicant is proposing a mixed use development consisting of single family detached homes and townhomes and twin homes, they're considering, to, considering developing about 140 to 145 dwelling units, which is five units per acre. With this report, the applicant has submitted a conditional zoning ordinance, in which they offer conditions pertaining to building setback and vehicle access. Key points from the staff analysis, um, the zoning site abuts a mixed residential development to the east and south, that's the Laurel Oak Ranch development. And that development consists of a combination of single family townhomes and multi family dwellings. The southern boundary of the zoning site abuts the multi family portion of the Lower Oak Ranch development, and this apartment complex developed at a density of 16 units per acre. The applicants also offer the condition that if multi family structures are developed on the site, they would need to be set back at least 100 feet from the northern property line to Five, provide a buffer or a separation from the budding rural subdivision to the north. As for mitigating adverse impact, um, those um, would be addressed by the developer ordinance. The ordinance would require standards for exterior lighting, permanent landscaping, screen of solid waste facilities. Furthermore, the requested R5 district restricts building height to 50 feet 
That's the same height that's allowed for single family dwelling and limits townhome structures to six attached units. There are some environmental impacts on the eastern portion of the site, some streams and some slopes. The development ordinance will require stream buffers in those areas. Um, staff recommends approval of the request to rezone this 29 acre site to the CZR5 district. Staff finds that the request is consistent with adopted policy guidance because the land use plan classifies this area as low density residential, which supports residential uses at a density of five minutes per acre. And both the current CUR5 and the proposed CZR5 allows residential development at a density of five units per acre. The request is reasonable in public interest because the proposal will allow the creation of a residential development that will provide a land use transition from the higher density multifamily development adjacent to the south to the lower density single family residential development to the north. And you have in your packet the consistency statement for the commission's consideration. Are there any questions of staff at this time on this request? Any questions, Mr. Shen? Thank you, sir. Is the applicant present with us? Um, this is Judy Stalder. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Judy Stalder, 3735 Admiral Drive. Um, Greg Garrett is also on the call in, um, in case you have any questions for the developer. Um, you may remember looking at this site before and unanimously approving a similar rezoning for this property last November. Um, this is the same request for conditional zoning RN5, which is in conformance with the land use plan. But the main difference is that we flipped the site plan. Um, the townhomes are now proposed to be adjacent to the apartments to the south, so a um, transition of density there. And there will be single family homes adjacent to single family homes to the north. The price point is higher as well. The townhomes will range from $190,000 to $240,000. And the single family homes will be in the upper two hundred dollars to lower $300,000. Um, and all of these are homes for sale. Um, the conditions are the same. Any multifamily homes will be located a minimum of 100 feet from a single family home. And um, I mean, from the boundary where existing single family home is. And there will be two points of access to Horny Town Road. Um, the number of units here did not meet the threshold for transportation impact analysis, but where the transportation connections will be are obvious. There are no opportunities to the north, east, or south due to the topographic challenges and existing development patterns. So the site will, cannot, will not connect to any local street. The two required access points are to Horny Town Road, a major roadway. And there will be no driveways connecting to Horny Town Road, only those two points of access. Um, we expect NCDOT will require some improvements to handle the traffic there, but we're perfectly able to meet those. Um, and like before, we're reserving significant open space for water quality, um, to protect the environmentally sensitive slopes, and um, for a buffer along Rich Fork Creek. We were unable to meet with the neighbors due to coronavirus precautions. But we did send out a letter with a site plan and contact information and did not receive any calls or emails from the neighbors. Um, so we ask for your favorable recommendation. Very well. Uh, any of the commissioners have questions for the applicant? Thank you, Ms. Dollar. Uh, we'll now open the floor for deliberation by the commissioners. I'm going to start with a comment in support of this request. I, I like what they've done by flipping the site plan and keeping the multifamily homes together and keeping the sing, single family homes together. I think it's a more uniform plan. Um, just something I noted they did, which I think is a good improvement. Yeah, this is Mark Walsh. Uh, I'll be honest with you, if you saw the topo of that property, it's, it's amazing what they've done with it. I've looked at it, it's tough. So I think, I think it'd be a good thing. Anything else from the commissioners? Mr. Chairman, it's Herb Shannon. Just for any members of the public who may be listening, 
Um, as Mr. Stalder noted, there was a previous request that the commission recommend approval in October 2019. That request was withdrawn by the previous applicant prior to going to city council. So it did not receive any vote from council. That previous applicant withdrew after the planning zone commission. Thank you. Well, if there's no more discussion, commission, I'll close the public hearing on this item. Commission members are asked to review any additional public comments received on this item in the next 24 hours, and we will give further consideration and make a recommendation at the recess meeting on Thursday beginning at 6 p.m. Next item on tonight's agenda, Premier Stories Incorporated, Zoning Map Amendment 20-10. Yes, Mr. Chairman, Herb Shannon with the City High Point Planning and Development Department. This is a request to amend a conditional zoning order on an approximately four acre tract of land in the northeastern portion of the city's planning area at the southwest corner of West Glendora Avenue in Piedmont Parkway. As you may recall, in 2018, the applicant from your stores submitted a request to rezone this site and they were granted approval by council to establish a conditional zoning in the business district. Last year in 2019, Premier Stores also submitted another request to rezone the site from conditional zoning limited business to conditional zoning general business to allow a major, major eating establishment. That's a restaurant, a drive through window. And that request was approved by the city council. This current request submitted by the applicant um, is pertaining to standards of the East Church Gateway Corridor. Um, the current conditional zoning ordinance for the site addresses policies of the West Windover Avenue Gifford College Quarter Plan. This includes conditions that development meet standards of the East Church Gateway Quarter Overlay District. The, the applicant is currently developing the site. If you had a chance to drive by, you see that the site is currently under construction. They desire to install an electronic changeable, changeable copy sign on the site to display fuel prices for your convenience store. This type of signage is prohibited under the East Church Gateway Quarter Overlay Standards, and thus the applicant has submitted this request. There is an adjacent commercial establishment at the southeast corner, that opposite corner, that has a convenience store with its electronic changeable copy sign used to advertise fuel prices. That commercial development to the southeast um, obtained his zoning approval prior to the establishment of the Guilford College West Windover Avenue quarter plan and therefore is not subject to the signage standard. This amendment to the conditional zoning ordinance only proposes to change that one aspect to allow an electronic changeable copy sign. All other signage standards of the East Chester Gateway Quarter standards will still be met and the applicant is bringing forward all those previously adopted zoning conditions. Key points to note from the staff analysis, the request of the amendment does not change previously approved compatibility findings used to establish the CZGB district on this site. And except for the allowance of electronic change of copy sign, all other standards are being met. All other East Chester sign standards as to sign height, copy area are still being met. And the development ordinance will govern brightness of display, change rate of display. Therefore, staff has recommends approval of the request to um, establish this amendment of this only of this one aspect to the sign standards for this site. Staff finds that the request is consistent with our policy guidance, policy guidance because the amendment CZ G district adheres to recommendations of the West Windover Griffin College Plan except for one aspect of signage. And the request is reasonable in the public interest because a similar sign is used to display fuel prices in the adjacent commercial development located at the same intersection. Included in the staff report is a consistency statement for your consideration. Are there any questions of staff at this time? The chair recognizes Mr. Juzak. So I don't I don't see any real problem with having an electronic sign. What I'm what I'm pondering is this is the third time we've visited this site in the last what two years? And, I, and I'm sort of wondering if when they did the original plan for rezoning, they had included the drive-in window and they had included this sign, would that have made their request less likely to be approved? I mean, are they are they nickeling and diming us? Will we be back here in six months with another little thing that they need to tweak? 
I know I may have to hear. <laughs> well, sorry, I would just note on each one of those requests that provide a recommendation and the commission makes a recommendation and the council makes a final decision. Um, I would note that the initial requests in the establishment of CZLB district staff did have concerns and recommended now council approve it and set updated policy for the site. Same issue with the request to establish GB district, council will establish that policy. Under request, the main thing that is will determine is this one sign issue. I think it is important to note that there is a similar sign outside in this area. If there are any future requests, the board, the commission would have a chance to make a determination that they feel is appropriate, but the city council would also make a determination. And if I may, this is Lee Burnett, the planning director. Um, I think as this development happened, more information came available and the fact that this sign was not allowed uh, came to light. And so for that reason, that's why they submitted this request. I don't, they would have, I'm, I'm, when the applicant speaks, I'm sure they would agree. If they'd have known this when they made their initial submittal, they would have uh, requested this as well. Uh, Chair, recognize Mr. Wheatley. Yeah, the only thing I was going to say, I think that uh, their last request for the drive through window was for a leasing opportunity that came up during the build. You know, I think it was a particular customer that came, said we need a drive through and they had already plan the space without one. So I think that's why that came up then, but this is a little late to get. Commissioner, a question for, for staff. The adjacent parcel, which has a similar sign, exactly how did they go about getting that? Was that a similar request to this? That was, at that time, that request came through the um, Guilford College Road window recorder plan was not a policy that was not set. Okay. So at that time, <clears throat> that issue of meeting each other standards didn't come up because that was not a policy issue at the time. It was only after that site developed that that quarter plan was adopted. Very well. Any other questions for Mr. Shannon? If not, thank you, Mr. Shannon. And is the applicant present? Hi, this is Judy Stalder, 3735 Admiral Drive. Um, Bill Kleinman from Premier Stores is also available for questions. Um, the owner and developer of this property, Mr. Kleinman, is asking for a minor amendment to allow an electronic changeable copy sign for gas prices. The rest of the sign meets the corridor um, requirement that's just the electronic part of changeable copy that doesn't need it. Um, this sign's not out of character with the neighborhood. And um, gosh, I'd like to say that um, we're here with staff support tonight for this change. I know that this seems piecemeal, but um, things are changing all the time, as y'all know. And a developer um, doesn't always have the opportunity to turn on a dime, to pivot, or whatever we're calling it these days. But in this case, we do have that opportunity, and we hope that you can support this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? If not, we'll move to deliberation among the commissioners. I mean, I, uh, this Commissioner Kirkman, uh, I think we, we have done this several times, not just for this property, for others. And, and we, uh, we always come up with a precedent. If you allow it one place, more than likely you're going to be compelled to allow it the next one down the road that asks for it. But I'm just going to put that out there and we can consider that and talk about it more a Thursday evening after we've had time to uh, hear from any other members of the public that would like to weigh in. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, Mr. Shannon explained the situation, I thought, very well. And if the issue is just should they have an electronic sign, it's not an issue. Uh, you know, there is one just across the street. Uh, I go through all the time and I know what the, exactly what they're talking about. So it was the same thing with the drive-in. When we were, when we were talking about the drive-through, we were like, okay, we really weren't arguing about the drive-through. We were arguing about everything else. That we were about. So yeah, so I don't, I don't really have, you know, I feel like, okay, the, the, the city council has voted. 
they've, they've got us to this point. Now the question simply is, do we want to put a sign there? Yeah. I, I would put a sign. Yeah, this is Mark Washington. I, I say the same thing and I'm in favor. I know we're not voting, but I'm in favor of it because I think that's about all they can come back for. All right, any other comments from commissioners? If not, I'll close the public hearing on this item. Commissioner members, we ask to review any additional public comments received over the next 24 hours and we'll give further consideration and make a recommendation at the recess meeting on Thursday beginning at 6 p.m. Next item on tonight's agenda, High Point Investment Holdings, LLC, Zoning Map Amendment 20-11. Mr. Shannon. Yes, Mr. Chairman, <coughs> Kurt Shannon. The next two applications are related. That's Zoning Map Amendment 20-11 and Zoning Map Amendment 20-12. Staff will provide a combined presentation. Uh, there is a combined conditional zoning ordinance for the two cases, so the commission can vote on them together upon the same determination and consistent statement and recommendation. This site is located in the western portion of the city's planning area. This site was initially annexed to the city in 2007. The case 20-11 has approximately 65 acres. Case 20-12 has approximately 7.9 acres. This is coming forward this manner in that where the northern portion of, of these uh, these areas connect. I don't know if you can see my little red dot here, right in this area. There's a 20 foot strip of land that separates these two areas that's owned by a different problem. Because they're not contiguous, it has to come forward as two separate zoning applications. That's why it's coming in that manner. In 2018, the current conditional zoning RM16 district was established on the site uh, for the 73 acres for development of a mixed residential development of up to 600 units. That prior zoning submittal was prepared by the property owner in preparation to mark the site to various potential residential developers. A, develop, a development firm has purchased the southern 42 acres and is proposing to develop a single family subdivision. However, they desire to phase the development in a manner that requires a previously identified track boundaries to be revised. That initial application that the property owner put together, that included a, a, a conditional zoning map identifying the configuration of various tracks. The new, the person or the development firm looking to do the single family dwellings on the southern 42 acres is proposing to amend those boundaries and also correspondingly amend the, the traffic conditions as far as road improvements to correspond with those changes. This amendment proposes to adjust track boundaries uh, that will revise tracks A, B, and C. No changes are proposed to track D. The applicant has submitted an amendment, amended conditions on the sketch plan that adjusts these boundaries and, and transportation conditions that are clarifying which street improvements in the budding subdivision are to occur as each track developed. <laughs> this exhibit is the track boundary that was adopted in 2018. As you can see, track A, B, and C. This is the revised boundary map that they're proposing. Primary changes are occurring in this mid portion of the site with some slight changes to the configuration of tracks A, B, and C. I put together a table to outline that. For track A, the acreage is staying the same, just the configuration is changes, changing, no change in uses or um, density restrictions. Track B, the area is being increased by 12.7 acres. Track C, that area is being decreased by 12.7 acres. No changes in track D. And for once again, for all the tracks, A through D, there's no change in the type of residential use permitted. No changes in the restrictions that were previously adopted. They're being carried forward in this new request. And this is kind of a, a composite map to help illustrate the changes. For track A, the, the dark lines show the original boundary, but you see that area in green, how that configuration is changing. Track B, that was the original configuration, but that area in pink shows how it's being expanded into track C. And as I previously noted, there are no changes to track D. Key points to note from the staff analysis, no changes in uses, all the density restrictions that were previously adopted being carried forward. 
No change in the maximum allowable number of residential units. Furthermore, the request will not adversely affect adjacent lands as the proposed modification to track boundaries are occurring on the eastern portion of the site away from that abutting rural subdivision. As far as impacts to public streets, they will still be mitigated. The proposed changes in the conditional zoning ordinance just clarifies what streets are to be improved in that budding rural subdivision to connect it to as each tracks develop. There was some confusion on that, and this clarifies that. Um, staff is recommending approval of the requested <coughs> amendment to this conditional zoning ordinance. Staff finds that the request is consistent without the policy guidance because the land use plan designates this area as medium density residential, which supports a variety of residential use types at a density up to 16 units per acre. And the request is reasonable in the public interest because the requested amendment only adjusts the timing of transportation improvements in conjunction with modification to track boundaries. It does not change any of the previous required improvements. And as we offer those findings that are part of staff report and statements for the commission's consideration. Are there any questions of staff at this time? Chair recognizes Mr. Juzak. Uh, this is because I wasn't around when the first one went through, but why would a developer want to create this island, High Point Island in Forsyth County? I know we have other parts in Forsyth County. Well, I would just note this is within the city's planning area. <clears throat> so this area up to the state road 66 is eligible for annexation. And the city does have utility lines in this area. This area became more attractive to development in 2015 with the development of the Colo um, Industrial Development <coughs> North and the extension of water and sewer lines into this area. The other properties that currently exist there, which are in Forsyth County, do not have water and sewage from the from the county for Forsyth. I believe Davidson Water does have some lines in this area, but the majority of the development in this area is on well accepted. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Shannon? If not, thank you. Is the applicant present with us this evening? Hi, this is Judy Stalder, 3735 Admiral Drive. And I've forgotten to say so far, good evening, but good evening, commissioners. Um, this, this request is just to do two things. Um, the original developer or owner of the property and potential developer um, sold part of this property to another developer builder. And what we'd like to do is adjust the tracks on the southern portion of this property to um, allow that developer to expand his single family subdivision. Um, the second thing we're doing is clarifying the language for the um, improvement of the road. I think all of us, um, the applicant and staff agreed that the language was saying what it says now, but we just weren't sure that it would be interpreted that way in the future. So um, just clarifying that language for future use, um, and we ask for your favorable recommendation. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Very, very well, we'll move on to deliberation by the commissioners, either of these two items. If we don't have anything, I'll close the public hearing on this item. Commission members will be asked to review any additional public comments received over the next 24 hours and we'll give further consideration and make a recommendation at the recess meeting on Thursday beginning at 6 p.m. The next item on tonight's agenda, City of High Point Text Amendment 20-02. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the, uh, the commission. My name is Chris Andrews of the Planning and Development Department. Uh, agenda item three, Roman General eight, is a text amendment to amend the city's development ordinance. Uh, this text amendment includes uh, a variety of changes which were identified by staff uh, and those uh, which have been necessitated by recent changes in state legislation. Uh, as with previous general amendments, I think it's been almost a year since you've had one. Uh, as with previous General amendments to the development ordinance. Uh, most of these were were 
or can be categorized by corrections of errors, omissions, uh, things to help clarify items, uh, or to add uh, uh, add graphics or, or, or things, uh, mostly wording changes uh, and some minor substantive changes. Uh, however, uh, the state legislation, which was adopted in uh, 2019, uh, results in most of the required ordinance text changes that are, are for consideration today. Uh, in general, uh, the amendment aims to do uh, a, a couple things. There's some revisions to vested rights in uh, establishment of something called development permits. That's a required requirement for state legislation. Uh, there's uh, items to revise conditions of approval. Uh, that's also through uh, state, state legislation. Um, there's a uh, provision to remove the minimum dwelling unit size as required by state legislation. Um, there's some revisions of financial guarantees so that uh, within our ordinance so that they're consistent with state legislation. Uh, there's a revision to payment in lieu procedure as well as uh, removing some uh, Removing a sub collector street term, uh, which, which we're no longer using, uh, and to clarify some commercial use types. And then finally, the addition of graphics, uh, errors to be corrected, and just promoting more consistent wording throughout the development ordinance. Uh, within your report, or within your, the staff report, there, there are details of the proposed amendment, uh, which goes section by section. Um, they're grouped, uh, each section is grouped by topic. Uh, and then the list of the reason for that change. Uh, th those amendments which are necessitated by uh, state legislation include the <laughs> appropriate uh, session law numbers uh, in the summary. Uh, in all, uh, the proposed development amendments uh, continue the, the city's efforts uh, to make the development ordinance more user friendly, uh, more consistent in its formatting, uh, its language and terminology, and, uh, and more error free. Uh, staff recommends uh, approval of these uh, amendments. Um, these, uh, with consistency to adopt the policy guidance, these general amendments uh, make the use and make the ordinance more user friendly, flexible, and supportive of the city's adopt policy guidance. And in considering the reasonableness, of public interest, uh, the proposed amendments to, to the development ordinance address necessary changes as a result of state legislation continue to pursue uh, making the ordinance error free, easier to re read and understand, and more consistent in its language and formatting. Uh, again, staff recommends approval of the request, and if there are uh, any questions of the commission, I would be, be happy to, to answer. Any questions, Mr. Andrews? I would just state, this is Mr. Usack, I would just state that uh, I didn't see anything jump out at me as unreasonable or anything like that. There are relatively, I mean, there's really not a lot of, uh, this is Mr. Andrews, uh, there's not a, a, any substantive changes, uh, and most of the things that are might be substantive or, or at least look substantive in, in length uh, are necessitated by state uh, legislation. Very well. Any other questions for Mr. Andrews? Thank you, sir. And with that, I'll open the floor to the commissioners for any further discussion or comments. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing on this item. Commission members will review any public comments received on this item over the next 24 hours. And we will get further consideration and make a final recommendation at the recess meeting on Thursday, beginning at 6 o'clock p.m. We'll move now to new business, which will begin with the election of officers, chair and vice chair. Uh, um, I was going to ask the ones that are remotely at home, is there any of y'all interested in being chair or vice chair? If not, I was going to make a motion that we just leave it as is. Mr. Venable, Ms. Swift. That works for me. Ms. Sounds good to me. I will second that motion. Who is that? Ms. Swift. Swift. Well, in that case, uh, uh, do we hear from uh, Commissioner McGill or Commissioner Stone? They have any? I agree. Any very, very well. I agree. Very well. Uh, in that case, we have a uh, motion Commissioner Walsh and a second Commissioner Swift to 
keep the officer positions as they are now. Mr. Kirkman, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Walsh, all the vice chair. Okay. Are you ready to proceed with the rule? Okay. When I call your name, please answer yes or no. You approve of uh, keeping Mr. Kirkman as the chair, Mr. Walsh, all the vice chair. Yes. Mr. Kirkman. Yes. Ms. McGill. Yes. Ms. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Swift. Yes. Mr. Venable. Yes. Mr. Walsh. Yes. Mr. Weeding. Yes. Mr. Chairman, you have eight votes in favor of that. And by a vote of eight, eight and zero, the motion is passed, and the officer remains there this year with myself. Which Kirkman is chair and Mr. Walsh is vice chair. Final item on tonight's agenda will be the, oh, we do have the department work program. We have a presentation on that. It was, is that being recognized? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah. I thought you might want me to ask. Want me to ask you a Good evening. This is Lee Burnett. Um, as you know, uh, the commission, uh, we do an annual work program every year, uh, which looks at the um, the work of the department over the next uh, fiscal year, which runs from July 1 to June the 30th, uh, and we schedule projects for, for staff as well as um, uh, to make sure they work consistently with our budget uh, as anticipated for that, that fiscal year. Um, somebody has their mute their computer. Yeah. Um, anyway, the um, what I wanted to share with the commission tonight is sort of go over some of the projects. Many of these projects are ongoing now. Um, and uh, there are projects that began in last fiscal year that will continue and we finished out in, in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, we did have um, scheduled to be implemented this year. We'll be starting our comprehensive plan for the city, uh, but due to the budget issues that resulted from the uh, pandemic, uh, budget the city council had to make uh, budget decisions and one of the decisions they had to make was cutting the comprehensive plan. So we will not be able to start it in full this year, but staff will be going forward with some tasks. We're going to be looking at uh, uh, existing um, conditions. We'll be looking at that during the past year for, for the community, which looks at population, demographics, things in the, that are occurring in the community. And we'll be also trying to look at uh, possibly doing some of the policy audit that we initially sort of targeted for the consultants to do, at least be able to get some of the work started in hopes that maybe next year at this time, funding will be available for us to go forward with a true conference plan for the city of High Point. Uh, as you may recall, we had a land use plan. Uh, the city has had a land use plan for a number of years. Uh, we, it's been updated through various amendments as we go along, but uh, what we're trying to move towards a more comprehensive approach, not just looking at land use, but looking at all the components that go into a community and try to put forth a, a comprehensive approach of policies, not just look at a land use plan in terms of growth and development. Uh, another project we're working on now with, with the part, I'm excuse me, the, the, not part, uh, the part 150 study, which is with uh, PTIA uh, Airport, uh, looking at the noise impact analysis. That study uh, is ongoing now, will be completed in the fall. Uh, and another conference project we have ongoing is the Southwest Area Plan, which is looking at the southwest portion of the downtown, just south of the tracks and uh, west of uh, uh, Main Street. Uh, in that area, the older industrial area, looking at trying to uh, see, <coughs> look at possible uh, reuse and redevelopment of that area, particularly looking at the, uh, the building infrastructure that's there. 
Uh, that was a project that was moving along fairly well until we hit the pandemic and we've got a study committee and that study committee has been sort of in hiatus. Uh, we're going to be looking to try to regroup uh, in a month to get that completed this year. That's a project that will come before you as a as a plan for adoption uh, policy. Uh, in line with that is a small scale manufacturing initiative. We're working with uh, uh, multiple departmental effort with economic development lead and looking at opportunities to encourage small scale manufacturing operations. Uh, this is this is something that resulted from a report that was done from a Smart Growth America uh, grant that we were technical assistance grant that we were able to receive the other year, and uh, we've gone forward and trying to continue to grow uh, small base uh, small scale manufacturing businesses within the community. Uh, our initial target area is the Southwest area, so this sort of runs in in conjunction with the Southwest area plan. But we're looking at initiatives that maybe uh, that can be sort of uh, uh, worked throughout the whole community, not just in the Southwest area, but we felt that's an area that has great opportunity for some of these small scale manufacturing initiatives. A um, couple of other projects that are related uh, to, and some of these things are ongoing, the airport overlay district assessment. Once the, the part 150 study with the airport is complete, we'll take an assessment of the recommendations. And then if there's any initial changes that need to be made in the airport overlay district, we'll bring that to the commission. Uh, and also to the city council for adoption. Uh, that will be uh, following on the tail of that completion of that R150 study. So probably sometime um, uh, towards the end of this year, calendar year or the first part of next year, we'll be um, bringing forth some recommendations. Um, Herb has presented to you a number of comprehensive zoning map amendments. Uh, we've got another one that will be coming to you next month uh, with some changes uh, where we're updating uh, uh, outdated sections of, the, of our zoning map uh, that uh, it doesn't match up either with policy or with development that is consistent there or may pose some kind of uh, constraint because all the conditions have been met and it's still under some kind of conditional zoning of two ordinances ago. <laughs> and so uh, this, will, this will be an ongoing multi-year effort. It'll be going on for a number of years, but uh, this is one that uh, will continue. Another project that just got initiated, got adopted last week was the, um, went into effect, I should say, is uh, 160D. This is the new planning legislation uh, that affects all uh, cities and counties in North Carolina. Uh, it basically consolidates all the planning legislation for both cities and counties into one section of the general statutes. Uh, there's not a host of substantive change. There is some minor changes that will occur as a result of the uh, of our implementation of this legislation. This legislation is in effect now. However, we have until July 1st of next year, 2021, in which to implement 160D. So this is an amendment process that we'll be working on uh, in the fall and probably bring it to you probably after the at the beginning of the year for consideration and adoption. These are required amendments, just like the ones that Chris brought you tonight. I mean, these are required ones, but uh, it is it's going to be some minor changes in terms of uh, process. Uh, Mr. Walsh, you may remember we used to swear in members of the Planning Zoning Commission, but well, we're going back to that. That's a requirement now. So there's several things like that that'll, that will change. Uh, so each member, <laughs> when uh, you come up with a new term, you'll be sworn back into office. So there's several things like that. that I changed your background. We have several uh, text amendments that we've been working on and will continue to work on, as well as uh, some that will be starting in addition to the ones that were just mentioned about 160D. The signing standards, we're still working with the consultant on that. We've had some slowdown and, and some unforeseen issues that popped up during the last year, but uh, we hope to get that out uh, this uh, year and get it moving forward and at least consideration by the Planning and Zoning Commission this year as well. Um, that should be uh, forthcoming uh, as quickly as we can get it uh, completed. Um, there are, um, I'll skip over of the standards and practices, which is mainly an update of some of our internal standards uh, with regards to how we uh, obtain submittals and things of that nature for, for applications. Uh, we are looking at, we're currently uh, revising our watershed protection regulations as a result of some rule changes that uh, the state has done and will be doing or anticipating doing this that will go into effect this, this calendar year. And so we should be bringing that to you this fall as well as a wireless telecommunication amendments. These are uh, our wireless 
communication and then this deals with all types of wireless, whether it's uh, the tall macro towers or the small cell wireless that may be in black holes along the street. There's been a host of federal and state changes over the last couple of years. Uh, we hired a consultant to help <coughs> us uh, smooth out a process so we can make a process more uniform, uh, deal with some of the regulations, uh, make sure our ordinance was in compliance with federal and state law in all aspects. And uh, we hope to get these uh, changes to you um, uh, likely by the end of summer. So uh, hopefully maybe in, in um, September, October timeframe, maybe seeing these changes. Uh, and then we've got a land use plan uh, update uh, database, uh, excuse me, land use database project that we're working on. Uh, this is sort of a base project to help us facilitate uh, doing some of our conference plan uh, studies. Uh, we have obtained some software that helps us run some scenario plan planning. So that looks at uh, sort of sort of what if scenarios, if things change. Uh, but one of the things we need to have is a good set of base data. Let's sort of what's, what's on the ground, what exists. And so we've been working with our GIS IT department to try to get that database and uh, hopefully we'll get that completed in the next couple of months. Uh, but that's a carryover from last year. Most of the projects that we're working on are just continuations of what's there, what's required. Uh, like I said before, we had hoped to get the conference plan started this year, but due to budgetary constraints, that's just not going to be possible. Uh, but we're, hope, we're trying to work towards to make sure that maybe next year we can start that conference planning project. And again, that will be something that the commission can participate in as well. That's sort of a quick summary of the, of the work program. Uh, any questions, anything I need to, to respond to from the commissioners, either uh, present or remotely? I'll assume no. Okay. Well, I have just a question. Yes, sir. How long do you think we'll have to meet like this? Just a guess. Um, it, this is a changing environment. Uh, um, we are, you know, subject to what may change in the future with regards to what the government may announce this week, as well as may happen in the fall with any other kind of changes they have. They talk about a second wave. I think there'll be some kind of modified approach going forward uh, because if you read and understand everything that that large gatherings for, for an extended period of time indoors or something that's trying to be discouraged. So um, I think having traditional meetings of commission members, staff, applicants and public really puts a constraint. We don't have a facility big enough to Accommodate that at this point that is you know, equipped. So um, I think as as the, the city moves forward, trying to address you know this room here was modified so that this we could have a virtual meeting here. Uh, the other conference rooms were done as well. So uh, the city's been trying to sort of catch up, if you will, in terms of, of some of the, the necessary changes in order to have virtual meetings. Um, I think the long and short is I don't think anybody really knows. So we need to plan though until you tell us different to be here on Tuesday and Thursday night. Well, that may change. That could change okay. if, if, if by law, if we could get all the commissioners in a single room, then we do not have to be in that fashion. So the the law says if you if all members aren't uh, in the same room, and then we have members remotely participating like right tonight then you have when you have a public hearing it has to be sort of two parts you have to extend for the comments isn't that because the, the comment period has to go on for a longer public comment period it's yeah. not really a us being in yeah. different rooms doesn't yeah. seem like that is correct and um here's someone if i could have your help here you're going to the screen we're finished with this item. See if you can yeah, get this down with the other thing. So that's why I asked if, if, if Megan would like to comment, have any insight on uh, that comment in terms of our meeting going forward. So there's been some discussion amongst, as I mentioned earlier, that um, we're trying to follow the protocol that city council is following. And there's been discussion as recently as this afternoon of trying to get the council chambers equipped so that we could have the technology 
to have a meeting like this, but have everybody present. So for their, they don't meet again until July 20th. So there is a pretty good chance that um, all council member, or I'm sorry, all commission members may be available to meet at y'all's next meeting, which is July 28th. So like Lee mentioned, it is just absolutely, you know, evolving every day. And, you know, one major factor is going to be the governor's announcement this week regarding phase two, assuming we're still able to, we're tentatively trying to make it so that at the next meeting in July, that at least all of you all could be present to be in the room together, socially distanced, um, you know, taking all of the precautions so that you can have active conversation and, you know, see everything together versus remotely. So um, it'll depend on the announcement this week and it'll also depend on us confirming that we can uh, upfit the council chambers to have the appropriate technology that we need in there. So um, that being said, I don't believe that we'll be uh, able to have the public present for some time. So the verdict is still out on without the public present, we may still need to do the two part meetings to allow for public comment. The intention behind that from the legislature is to allow people to see the meeting and then comment on it since they can't comment in real time. So even if you all were able to be in a room together, the most likely for the foreseeable future, we won't be having a, you know, a, a very large event where the public will be able to be present for it. So um, it's just evolving every single day and we'll just do our best to keep you guys informed as we get the governor's announcement and then as things progress over the next couple of weeks to be able to get all commissioners in the same room together. So. Thank you. Lee, do you have anything else as far as director's report? Um, I, I had touched on most of the status okay. of those projects. They, they the only thing I just wanted to add is two things. Uh, one, um, uh, we, uh, you, we will have your next meeting on uh, July the 28th, I believe it is, and you have two zoning cases for that for that evening. One is uh, dealing with comprehensive uh, zoning amendments uh, project. I did want to note for the record, um, Mr. Armstrong has resigned effectively this, effectively this week. Um, his, um, he's been a member since 2014. He's been a, a member of the commission for six years, so we do have a vacancy on the commission now. Um, and, and Ms. Stone will be rotating off. Um, uh, she, uh, interesting, has been with the um, on the commission for, for 12 years, for, since 2008. Uh, but before that, she was on the Board of Adjustment for uh, for six years. So uh, she, she's served about 18 years for the city uh, in both factions. So this this and Thursday will be her last meeting. So I did want to uh, indicate that she's online. I appreciate her service to the city um, and her time. And enjoyed working with her. And um, we will have a plaque and hopefully be able to present it at a future uh, commission meeting uh, honoring your service, as well as the John Trumps. Maria checks in the well, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say I've really appreciated the knowledge I've gained working with the city staff. It's been a privilege. Well, uh, if there's nothing else, and before we make a motion to recess tonight, on the chance any members of the public are still with us, I just want to mention again that they have another 24 hours to submit comments on any items discussed on tonight's agenda. They can email the comments to build at highpointnc.gov by calling 336-883-3522 and leaving a message. Or they can put written comments in the City of High Point's utility payment drop boxes, which are located on both sides of the municipal building at 211 South Hamilton Street. And with that, I will move that we recess this meeting and begin again on Thursday evening at 6 o'clock. Second. Commissioners, when I call your name, please answer yes or no um, regarding that motion. Mr. Juzak? Yes. Mr. Kirkman? Yes. Ms. McGill? Yes. Ms. Stone? Yes. Ms. Swift? Ms. Swift? I see your lips still reading. Yes, sorry, I forgot I muted myself. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Venable? Yes. Mr. Walsh? Yes. Mr. Wheatley? Yes. 
Mr. Chair, we have eight votes in favor of that motion. And then, this, um, Mr. Burnett, I uh, just want to know for the record that Mr. Walsh made the second. Yes. Well, with that, we are recessed until Thursday evening at 6 o'clock.